Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest to our actually already our fourth live stream. Uh, we bring these to you every other uh, Wednesday night when we don't have a new episode on a Wednesday since we do episodes every other week. Look forward to seeing people starting to stream in and join. Uh, we're back tonight with historians Andrew Rosco, Rosco and James Taub. Good evening, fellas. Hey, well, how are you doing? Well, I'm okay if I can actually t say your name, Andy. So, welcome. Um, as we get into it's the... It's only been 15 years, you know. Well, okay, maybe by 20 I'll have it right. So, Jim, how are you doing? Uh, not too bad. So, just... what... Go ahead. I was like, just thinking, one day at a time. Yeah, one day at a time. Well, we say good evening to Huck Green, to Jim Nebel, to Aiden, to Eric, Andrew Pleva. Blaine, how you doing? Seeing people starting to check in. Glad to have you guys with us. Huck says, what's the topic for tonight? Well, before we do the topic for the night, let's back up a little bit. What are we drinking? I'll start this evening. Uh, went one step up. I did Woodford Reserve two weeks ago when I was talking with John Weaver. Going for Woodford Reserve Double Oak this evening. Huck has a lemonade and gym. Andy, what do you have? I'm finishing off my Glenfiddich 12 year single malt, going sticking with my scotch. Great. Well, only so much down there. And Jim, what are you drinking this evening? I'm going for the James Brown Ale from James River Brewery uh, here in Scottsville, Virginia. So I'm trying to support myself as an adopted Virginian. Okay, cool. Stay Very good. Local. Yeah, John Spain says, wow, I actually caught you all live. Well, since it's live, let's quickly say this evening with Jim and Andy here, we're going to continue the discussion we've had a couple of times. Uh, the discussion is where does the Civil War fit in the timeline of military history? And using broad, fairly not precise comments, we'll say either the last Napoleonic War or the first modern war. And I know we have plenty of historians who would dial it in a lot tighter. That's why I say not very precise. The idea this evening is to continue to talk about what happened during the Civil War and where it fits. Tonight we're going to talk about technology and non-weapons technology since we killed weapons last time and did and did a real thorough job there. So Andy's laughing. I see him going, okay, killed weapons. That's pretty funny. So um, nonetheless, we're going to talk about other things in technology this evening. We've got quite a few images for you. So if you see me looking off, I'm trying to keep up with my notes to get sure the pictures are going for you. Uh, Eric Urbanis says he's got a fine glass of uh, absinthe. And John Spain's having coffee. Scott Cummings, good evening. Glad to see a bunch of you guys here. Before we move in, let's handle some quick housekeeping here. First, uh, the CWDD Coffee Grinders. They are the patrons on Patreon who support Civil War Digital Digest. We're very close to 140 of them. And I've just got to say thank you so much. This makes what we're doing possible between episodes and I'll just detour and work out of order here. If you guys look behind me, you see three cameras built back here. Michigan Open Manufacturing up in the middle of April. We consider motion picture work, manufacturing. We've been working to make sure that we can do this safely. Uh, beyond just doing live streams, a small team from Civil War Digital Digest will be shooting next Monday, June 1st, provided we have good weather. Because one of the things we've worked out to be a best practice and be safe is we're going to be shooting outside as much as we can. So we're excited to get in the field and cut some new content, bring it for you. Uh, if Mark Halliker is um, with us, he's going to really enjoy some of the stuff we're shooting on Monday. So um, to the patrons, new patrons and promotions, we just got to say some thank yous here, specifically to Dennis Brinker for a promotion, to Franklin Van Valkenburg for joining, to Francis Chapel for becoming a regimental patron, and to Lauren Mooney for the same thing. Thank you guys so much. So, see more people checking in. Okay, Hux Green says, uh, buy, buys the drinks. No, we do not use the money from Patreon <laughs> to buy the drinks, Huck. So, and Huck is one of our patrons, so he's busting my chops. So, guys, let's get to it. Let's start talking. Uh, we're going to start in the discussion this evening about technology, uh, looking at technology uh, with transportation. Who wants to start it off here? Well, uh, I, can get, I can get kicked off on transportation. Okay. Um, so, so railroads are coming onto the scene about the 18, you know, 
Railroads have been on in a non-powered form or like using animal power, human power through up through the 1820s. Suddenly in the 1830s, uh, you start seeing the Baltimore and Ohio has the General Tom Thumb. Uh, and then there's a railroad in Charleston, South Carolina, that's one of the first to actually in the U.S. to put a steam engine on a to make a locomotive to actually put train to move a train. You know, within, you know, and then. 30 years later, we're talking about the Civil War, and the growth is incredible in this industry from 18, you know, from 1830 to 1860. Yeah, it, I, and you kind of build off, it, it's amazing just to see, like, within the 30 years, you're going to be able to move a few people on a single locomotive engine to moving regiments and brigades from one part of the country to the other, to thousands of people at once. So it's really an explosion of this technology. Um, it's, uh, Andy, do you want me to steal the numbers Andy, uh, peaceably donated to us <laughs> earlier before he did the, sure, Jim, uh, go for it. <laughs> he did the research on the actual railroad mileage. And, uh, there's, there's talk of the difference between the North and the South and the mileage in the civil war of physical track laid down. And we're talking about in what becomes the, the Northern States of the civil war, 22,000 miles as compared to 9.5 thousand in the south nine thousand five hundred miles so quite a differential and you can see where the railroad industry is really focusing its efforts great yeah well it, you know and part of the thing though that's interesting when i pulled these is i also pulled for europe and we always talk about the north and south and you know there's always this talk about the south being agrarian and the south not being industrialized but the south with 9500 miles Beats out the UK with 8,700 miles, or Prussia with 6,800 miles, or France with 5,600 miles. You well, know, let me break the in there. Let, is low. I guess say, yeah. let me break in there real quick, Andy. Did you also run the uh, surface area of the country? What are we working I on? I did not. Uh, map, map size, the geography size to geography size. Does that affect anything there? Sure. The the density in the South is way less than Europe. You know, Europe is a much smaller footprint than the United States. So those defense, are relative. In defense of Andy, of Andy as well, though, you're talking about much larger population sizes in these European countries and more use over the smaller amount of rails versus uh, less use over a larger area as in North America. OK, great. Um. You know, and the interesting thing is in the United States, it's a it's a very private industry driven process. There is not state owned railroads out there. There's not state backed railroads or at least federal government. Uh, to what extent states are getting involved on the railroad? But in Europe, that's not the case. I mean, uh, the UK is very interested in their railroad growth. Prussia in particular is making a lot of investment in the railroads, particularly in the 1850s with the Royal uh, Westphalian Railway Company, which is operating in the western part of, uh, you know, the Rhine country of what is then Prussia will eventually be Germany. And then the uh, Prussian Eastern Railway, which is in, you know, East Prussia, which is now the Kaliningrad region of uh, Russia. You know, these, the, they're making investments from the state level because they see the potential for these for military and national defense purposes that we exploit in the Civil War, but, you know, only... We only take them over in the heat of the moment. There's no, uh, you know, pre-investment by the federal government in this. Cool. And I think it's really interesting as well that it's recognized in our Civil War the pretty early on the importance strategically. You always see stories of cavalry raids going to cut off railroads, and that's the fir that is a first in the American Civil War. Great. Well, what well, I, what you know, I can say? Let me ask this: What challenges do we run into uh, with the railroads uh, throughout the country, and especially in the South here? What what do, what issue do we have here? So, one of the really interesting things is the concept. There's a big fight going on about gauges. Gauges are simply the distance between the two tracks of the rails, and uh, different parts of the country are using different gauges. Uh, Pretty much in the UK in the 1840s and 50s, they come up with what is now called standard gauge. Four feet, eight and eight and a half inches is standard gauge. So in the north, a lot of rail companies are using English locomotives as well. So they adopt that as a standard gauge in a lot of places. However, New York is interesting that they have what we'd call a broad gauge. They have a six foot gauge, 
But by the Civil War, they've also started to double up where one track will actually have two tracks and can use both standard and broad gauge. But in the South, you have a weird mix of standard gauge and uh, five foot broad gauge which is too, slightly too wide to use a normal standard gauge locomotive, but too close to be able to double up the tracks. And this actually persists in the South all the way till there's a day in May 1886 when all the rail lines in the South got trans, transitioned to standard gauge in two days. Wow. That had, to be, that had to be something to see it going. Let me bust in with a question from Stan here, fellas. And just a reminder, everybody at home, we're recording this. If you want to watch it again or for other people who can't make it, you're going to be able to see it later on YouTube on our channel. So I'm, re I'm asking these questions to make sure everybody knows. Stan says, by what authority did the wartime national governments control railroad operations, given what you guys just mentioned about the railroads being private ventures? So... I can answer for, for Europe, and I'll, I'll let you guys answer for the United States. You have districts of the military in countries like Prussia, what becomes the German Empire, that are solely dedicated to running these uh, these trains. And it goes to the point that in 1870, which we'll talk about in a bit with the Franco-Prussian War, it is an immediate, as soon as war is declared, those rail lines are for military use only. And you see it again use extensively in 1914 with the outbreak of World War One, It is immediate. As soon as there is a threat to national security, in this case, German national security, the railroad is a property of the military. There are units of the military that sole job are the railroads. And you see the birth of that in the American Civil War as well with uh, with some creation of some of those units. So it, it, is, it is really a fact of life. And for many of these European states, the civil use and the economic use, um, whether they say I want to take a trip for the weekend to the beach, is a nice add-on to the fact that these exist for the military, if that if that sort of makes sense. Well, you know, and I think it's interesting going back to the discussion we had, the, the first discussion we had about staff work, the extent to which the Prussian general staff had made these plans for a mobilization and deployment based on these railroads that only came from their investment and control of the railroads. You know, it, the U.S. in the Civil War creates a, a U.S. Um, railroad department. Um, famously, Herman Haupt starts as a constructor and ends up at basically running the, the military railroads. But you're still talking about nationalizing private companies for the war effort rather than um, on an ad hoc basis. You know, there's still a lot of civilian traffic going on. You know, one of the things that people forget about is the race for the Transcontinental Railroad starts during the Civil War. You know, it was the Northern Pacific and the Union Pacific. They're starting this with the land grants that are coming out during the Civil War. So there's a lot of private railroad development and growth still going on during the war. Cool. Well, let me ask a Civil War specific question and then we'll move forward to Prussia here so we can move on. Uh, Doug Camper asked, and to see if either of you want to take a stab at, stab at this both sides tar uh, military targeted the railroads. What was the greatest fight involving a rail depot or bridge? All right. I mean, there's a few that are out there that are pretty cool. Uh, famous, there's the famous movie, The Horse Soldiers, which uh, with John Wayne, which is a fictionalization of the LaGrange raid done by uh, uh, William Gerson during uh, 1863. Uh I actually think probably the one that has the biggest impact is Stoneman's raid during the Chancellorsville campaign, though, because it actually deprived the Army of the Potomac of a cavalry screen. And dramatically, it's the one allowed Stonewall Jackson to do his famous flank attack. I think it's the one that had the most direct tactical input on a battle. How do you I think? Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I can't think of I would agree with Andy with Stoneman's raid. But I would also put out points that you can look at certain campaigns of the Civil War where the railroad may not have been the target, but the railroad created what we understand the campaign to be. And what comes to mind for me is the Monocacy campaign, uh, early's invasion of Maryland, where it's originally reports coming from civilians on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad saying, we think there's a Confederate army that's crossed the Potomac. <laughs> so um, so they, it plays a role whether it's the target or not. Okay, uh, let me just quick ask this. Uh, how do you guys place the Weldon Railroad fight and the work of enveloping Petersburg uh, throughout the fall of 64 to, uh, uh, to make the siege perfect there and, and end the war? I mean, the Weldon, uh, the siege of Petersburg is about cutting rail. It's all about rail lines. 
There are three major rail lines running into the city of Petersburg from the south, and Grant's entire job is to cut these three railroads. Um, the Weldon Railroad flight has a close place in my heart because it's pretty much the death of the old First Corps. Um, but ultimately, the Union Fifth Corps is able to hold the Weldon Railroad and force Lee's supply lines to use only the South Side Railroad. Uh, it also eventually led to the Battle of the Ream Station, things like that. But it's also less about... I mean, I, I think it's a little bit more of a... Uh, it has maybe less strategic impact than some of the other things, some other, uh, like maybe the Atlanta campaign or something That's like what, that. I was going to say it's, you know, the two types of transportation leading up to the Civil War and then into the Civil War in North America are rivers. You'll hear a lot about this from 18th century experts, right? Rivers are the highways of the past. But uh, then you've also got railroads now. So with the Union Army cutting the Mississippi River and then taking Atlanta, everybody likes to talk about Atlanta as this major city that Sherman captures in 64. There really aren't a lot of people who live in Atlanta at the time. The thing is, it's the rail hub for the entire South. So yes. that, that's where its importance lies. Jim, and let me, Jim, let me, board... I guess, let me just bust in and caution you. You know what happens when we wind Andy up with Navy things. You'd better be careful how much you talk about. We're waiting for later for that. <laughs> so. Navy things. Uh, well, you know, but it, like the thing about the Civil War is it's not just railroads, too. There's some really interesting development with roads. And I think we forget about this. Like, uh, in Europe, especially, the Romans built a ton of roads, and essentially for a thousand years after the Roman Empire collapses, no one's building highways from city to city that are anything more than dirt roads. They're just maintaining the Roman roads as best as they can. And then suddenly in the 1750s, 60s, you start to have, uh, there's a French engineer, Pierre-Marie Jerome Trezuat. I'm probably slaughtered that. Sorry, everyone in France. Uh, he comes up with basically the first idea for making a road since the Romans that's more than just dirt or cobblestones. And the idea is he's using multiple layers of big stones, eventually creating what's essentially a French drain of larger stones with smaller stones on top. It's highly cambered. It takes a lot of effort to build these roads. So there's not a lot of them during the Napoleonic Wars, but they're starting to be there. There are large highways that... But suddenly in the 18, 1820s, you have John McAdam, a Scottish engineer, who comes up with this idea for what we are called macadamized roads. And he uses much smaller stones, and he only uses about an 8-inch deep layer over just native soil. He has much less of a camber, but because the stones are a lot smaller, um, they're able to uh, drain properly. And in the U.S., there's actually – you're seeing a picture come up. There's there's actually macadamized roads. This is the Valley Turnpike that's up there. This is one of the road that cuts down the middle of the Shenandoah Valley. You, you know, we always talk about Stonewall Jackson and his foot cavalry. Part of the reason they can march 30 miles a day is they're marching on one of the best roads in the entire industrialized world. You know, there's the Telegraph Road outside of the Fredericksburg to Richmond area. You have um, – the, the national road that's going through Turner's Gap that the Iron Brigade's fighting up, these are all macadamized roads. These are state-of-the-art highways. And the cool thing, you've all driven on macadamized roads because when you mix, eventually someone came to the idea to put a tar layer over on top, which is tarred macadamized road or tarmac, and then over time they took it and mixed the tar in with the stones, which is something we call asphalt. All right, so... There we go. Uh, let's push this forward. Jim, uh, let's talk about roads in as we go forward into World War One. here. Yeah, absolutely. So almost immediately as you get into the First World War, you're going to see the use of these upgraded roads um, uh, to transport troops and supplies to the point that you are now going to see automobiles, which are a relatively recent invention, be used en masse and actually be incorporated into the military. And it starts off with just scrounging from the civilian world, which is a theme we're going to keep running into as we talk about a lot of these new technologies to the point, just two examples to highlight, 1914, the British, with a desperate need to transport during the race to the sea, that is, chasing the Germans after the Battle of the Marne, back up and forming what becomes the Western Front, send over the double-decker London buses to transport <laughs> men up and down. Just there's a desperate need for vehicles that can now use these modernized roads. As well, famously in France, I'll talk about the taxis of the Marne, uh, and they got Parisian city taxis to ferry out Galliani's Reserve Corps out of the city of Paris into the front. Now, very few guys actually were part of that uh, 
taking out by taxis. The vast majority of guys were on trains. But nonetheless, it becomes a propaganda tool in France that we really talk about. Um, And then as the war progresses, automobiles, cars, trucks become part of the military where you see transportation units formed that are no longer based on horses pulling wagons, but trucks pulling guns to the point that just after the war starts, the French get their first mobile artillery units. That means heavy guns being pulled by trucks. You see that with the British as well and with the Americans. With that comes new problems. Yeah, obviously, you having studied the Civil War um, with with all of the talk right now over the 1864 campaign as we're going through that anniversary cycle. Yeah, I love to read about the the Teamsters following the Army of the Potomac and the traffic jams and the length of the columns of Civil War armies as they move down the field. That's an issue during the First World War as well, but it becomes one of the biggest issues because when you have so many horses and so many cars now moving on a off of modernized roads onto outdated roads as the Allied armies push east on the Western Front, you're going to run into major traffic jams. And the largest problem the American forces have in France, and most commanders reference this at one point or the other, is not necessarily German resistance all the time. It's their own resistance. It's the traffic jams that are being coordinated. That's one of the, out of several, one of the main reasons you see the military police corps formed during World War I is to help regulate these traffic jams. I think one of the best uh, best representations of this is actually, if you guys remember the old movie Patton with George C. Scott, where he gets out <laughs> of the car and he's directing, not a World War I reference, but it's totally applicable. And you guys are seeing right now a photo on your screen of traffic jams uh, that were part of the Meuse-Argonne campaign. Uh, So this is taken during the fighting. These are all trucks that men are trying to drive forward, and it's full of desperate supplies to the point that they're within a few miles of the front line. But the doughboys up at the front aren't getting food. They're not getting the ammunition they need because they haven't figured out how to manage the residual conflicts that come with this new technology. Cool. So So what do we do, Jim? So you're going to start to see answers being formed, just like you saw a uh, railway troop formed. You're going to see engineer units. Generally, these are assigned to the engineer corps of the various militaries formed that their sole job is to work on roads. It's to p- repair roads. It's to create roads. It's to maintain roads. And you're going to see these through most of the major American militaries. These are going to be the guys that are creating bridges when they're destroyed, passing over roads. You're going to be seeing uh, men who are solely there to completely understand what macadamization and what tarmacking is to these roads to make sure that these problems can own can no longer be uh, a cause of nature right rain won't stop you anymore the only thing that could stop you are yourself so get your trucks all going on the same timetable great andy anything to throw in there well, you know, as I think there's a nice callback is there's def- I I remember I wish I could pull the the where I remember reading the reference of uh, General Hancock, the Second Corps commander during the Overland campaign. There's uh, I remember reading about him also directing a traffic jam at one point because if I remember right, there's a point where the Second and the Fifth Corps columns over uh, crossed each other. And uh, he was trying, there was bad staff work and he was trying to sort it out. But similar thing, the Civil War armies had these long trains. And, you know, traffic is an issue. It's one of the frictions of a military operation is ensuring that you're able to get people to and from the front quickly and efficiently. Okay. It's something that's going to devil us even to today. Okay. Well, let's take a look at, um, let's take that and let's go somewhere else. Jim, a little while ago, you said that the arm, uh, that the 18th century military and 18th century his- history people will talk about how the highway was the rivers was the waters. Andy, we're going to let you wind up a little bit, then we're going to stop you for a little bit. Go ahead and open the, do- open the door with us a little bit. What are we looking at as far as what's happening on the water a little bit? So just like the, just like combining the idea of a steam engine with a wagon made the locomotive, combining a steam engine with a ship makes a ch- watershed change in naval transportation. Steamships suddenly make it where river, tr- I mean, rivers have always been a mode of transport, but now it becomes something where it becomes less about manpower and more about engine power. And you have something like the Mississippi River, which has a very strong current that you can have easy two-way traffic on the river. You know, the end of the day, transporting something by water is far easier than transporting that same amount of tonnage by land. 
you know, one ship can carry several hundred tons of supplies. If you were to make a wagon train to do that, you're talking about a wagon train that'd be 10, 20 miles long just to carry the same number of stuff that one steamship like you're seeing on the on the page there uh, would be able to carry. I mean, that that's incredible. And not just on not just on the rivers, but also at sea. You have these blockade runners, these fast ships that no longer rely on wind, that they can travel by wind over the ocean, and then as they get close to the uh, get close to shore, can make a high speed run in past Union blockaders into a port and bring much needed supplies with them. These British ships that are coming in are brand new, some of the best maritime engines in the world. And if you take a look at the screen right now, this from the Library of Congress is one of the blockade runners. It didn't say what the name is, but you take a look at her. She's got, uh, she's a double side, uh, double side wheel paddle, and she's got a couple of stacks in there. So this, is, compared to a sailing ship, she's also rigged for sail, but she's a pretty formidable ship, and she doesn't have to wait for the wind to go. Yeah, and from a naval architecture perspective, it's very long and has a narrow hull, which means that long water edge which actually makes it very fast okay i got to point out as uh, to my second home that a lot of these ships are being built on the river clyde in glasgow um yeah so there's a strong connection which i learned when i was doing my master's degree between glasgow and the confederacy <laughs> okay great well let's move forward gentlemen let's pick up and we've done a little bit of time here we've done about 20 minutes talking about transportation Let's switch over to communication and let's start talking with um, the way things change throughout time. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Jim, you cool if I go first? Start off. Go or for it. Take the take. No, okay. take the lead. So, telegraph. Telegraph is one of the coolest and most quintessential American inventions of the 19th century. I love it that the guy who comes up with it is a world-famous painter. Samuel Morris was originally famous as a painter. On his way back from a European trip in 1832, he talks to a guy about magnetism and electromagnetism for a while, comes up with the idea of the telegraph. Guess what? We use Morse code to this day. And it's incredible. Again, it starts in the 1830s. It's almost nothing. But the Civil War, it's incredibly widespread. It's, you know, there's a U.S. military telegraph office. You know, one of the some of the great scenes in Lincoln's presidency happened in the Washington headquarters of the U.S. Military Telegraph Office. If you've ever seen the uh, seen the the film Lincoln, there's scenes where he's talking to a character played by Adam Driver in that office because he would sit there and wait out the nor war news when stuff was coming in. Um, also, what's cool is it's not just a operational and strategic level thing. It's getting used on a tactical level. One of the really cool inventions that doesn't get talked about is the Beardsley Telegraph. It's uh, instead of using um, uh, audio tunes, it actually had pointers. And the operator on one end would turn the pointer to different letters. And the operator on the other end, as he saw them, would match it up so that he under. Uh, so it was a way that someone is all you had to be was literate. You didn't have to be uh, no Morse code in order to do it. It was a short range system. It had a lot of problems. Unfortunately, uh, it's one big use in the Chancellorsville campaign was marred by uh, bad telegraph lines. But it's still a really cool system. Cool. Well, I will say Doug Camper just came in and said that Mosby cuts the telegraph line whenever he can. Of course, that's going to be part of counteracting it. So... Talk about how it's used at Petersburg. Uh, well, yeah, so the U.S. built both a railway line and a telegraph line behind the front. So the, uh, the U.S. military railway goes from City Point all the way out to the end, like essentially out towards Hatcher's Run. And they also have a railroad or a telegraph line that's running with it. So these are traditional Morse code stations, but now you're able to quickly send messages across you know, the Petersburg front goes all the way up to Richmond and it's, you know, 40, 50 miles long. If you're relying on horse, horse couriers to pass information, you would be a day behind any information by the time a message went and came back and any troops responded to that. Now you can respond within hours. Cool. Well, Jim, where does this take us as we go forward? What are we, what are we, how are we using telegraph and what else are we using into World War I? Absolutely. So Telegraph, you know, they, they take what they've seen from the American Civil War and other conflicts and continue to use it. I mean, telegraphs are being used not only for the military, but also in the civilian world. You can, one of my 
favorite videos to watch on YouTube, and I watch it generally for the anniversary, is you can see the telegraph message that the Titanic was sending out after it hit the iceberg. So it's 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 accepted across the world. They they figure out how to hack telegraph lines and figure out what uh, the enemy side is sending to each other. But then you also see the development of new technology, and namely that's the telephone. Uh, and you're going to see just as much acceptance of that as resistance to it. And part of that comes from the lessons of the American Civil War. Um, there are, one of our viewers mentioned Mosby loved to cut the telegraph lines. That was a lesson that militaries across the world took. And they said, well, it might not be reliable at these very important times where we need to get messages back and forth. So if we have this new technology like the telephone, why would we rely on it if it still has to use these lines? It's still better to use runners. It's still better to use uh, telegraph for long range and rely on wires the smallest amount possible. Where that changes is starting in 1914 and the use of indirect artillery fire, where you're communicating with soldiers on your side between a forward observer and the artillery battery behind that, and there's no possible way an enemy soldier is going to walk up with a knife and cut the wire. Enemy artillery might, as they later learn. That's where you're going to start to see the introduction of a telephone, where you have guys, and you'll see photos of this, with spools, wire spools on their back, crawling around, connecting the lines. And there's going to be an ad hoc rush to this. Remember how I said it was an ad hoc learning process with trucks as they were developed? Same thing, ha and they're using civilian equipment. Same thing happens during the same battle, the Battle of the Marne. The French army recognizes that they can use indirect fire with their famous 75-millimeter gun, which we talked about earlier. But they And they figure out that, well, maybe we should have invested in these telephones, which we've been putting off for so many years. So they actually send officers into Paris to take civilian telephones and literally <laughs> take the wires out. And there are dumps where they've literally gone into people's houses to businesses, taken the wires out of their telephone lines and are stacking them to use for the guns behind the lines. So there's that reluctance that they eventually overcome. And there still is some mistrust. That's why you see some more reliance on, on things like animals, like pigeons or dogs to run messages. But it's slowly becoming more accepted to the point that as we leave the First World War, we're starting to see the idea of, of telephones and radios that don't require any sort of wire. Okay. Well, we've talked about how things move forward. Is there any ways in which communication stays the same? Well, as a Navy man, I can tell you that if there is something that was good enough for Nelson, it's good enough for us today. And probably one of the things that jumps to mind the most, most is flag signals. So in uh, 1790, Lord Admiral DeLord Howe, um, who is famous during the American Revolution, is one of the Howe brothers. He's become First Lord of the Admiralty, and he, uh, he ends up coming up with a flag code. Uh, eventually in 1800, Sir Home Popham, uh, makes it where it's Royal Navy wide. And what's cool is uh, on your screen, what you actually have a picture of is HMS Victory, which was Nelson's flagship at Trafalgar, flying his famous um, his famous line, England, uh, England uh, confides every man will do its duty today. Well, that was his original message, but that's actually not what the message came out. Um, it's It's an interesting... It's an interesting story because it's a code that's all based on numbers. He he turned to his uh, he turned to his signal lieutenant and said, "Hey, I want to pass this message. England confides that every man will do its duty today. Hey, we trust you're going to do your duty. It's a big buck up message." But the lieutenant's like, "Sir, I can send this a little easier because of how this code worked. If I say England expects every man to do its duty today, which is interesting because it actually." Uh, it actually annoyed some of the ships in Nelson's Navy because they took it as a slight that, you know, he was chiding them to do their duty instead of, you know, Nelson was a famously gregarious commander. Uh, but it just shows that there's this way that an admiral can direct fleets out there using just flags. And it's a really cool way to uh, it's really uh, the English really developed at first. And by the Civil War, it is completely standard all over. It's how they're still directing fleets in Jutland in World War One. And we still teach it to our uh, quartermasters in the Navy today. Yeah, I'll, and I'll kind of add on and, and move on to that as well. I mean, uh, you've got signals that are going to be used through the eight, from the 18th century forward. I think as a First World War expert, one thing that immediately comes to mind that is a little bit different is the standardization of py what I'm calling pyrotechnic signals. So what I'm really thinking about there are, are flares, right? And this, again, is for immediate work for a commander behind the line to recognize 
what's going on to his men in front by the amount and color of the flares they're firing up. Famously, a red cluster uh, and a green cluster and another red cluster was SOS, meaning wherever you see this flare coming down from, send as much artillery as possible there. It's the World War One equivalent of like Broken Arrow for the, for yeah. the Vietnam experts. Um, so you're going to start to see the development of this. And you'll see written out in operations order for all militaries in World War I, this is going to be the signal for we've taken the ground for this particular operation. For the next particular operation, this is going to be the signal for we couldn't get through here, send the guys somewhere else. So you're going to see that and, developing as well. And smoke, too, to go along with pyrotechnics. Yeah. You know, In the military today, we use colored smoke canisters to indicate different things on different operations. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things going with uh, visual signals is the, the – I'm sorry – uh, audio signals want to talk about is I think it's really cool is you know in the British Army famously they've they're using whistles and bugles especially among light troops all through this period uh, you know the bugle really gets uh, its prominence starting with the British riflemen and light infantry in the Napoleonic Wars and what's really interesting is uh, the the light infantry whistle if you see there's a picture of a a English rifle brigade officer from the Battle of Inkerman in the Crimea, and fame on his cross belt is a silver whistle. Guess what? This is a direct precursor to the whistles that you see British officers, the trench whistles going over the top. You know, um, and it's, for me, it's really interesting to see that these audio signals still are getting used. And actually, I just we were talking about this in our pre our pre show stuff. I was watching uh, Bridge Too Far this week, and if you see one of the British generals has a signal whistle in the cross belt of his uh, his sword belt. Uh, just interesting how that carries all the way into World War Two. Yeah, and you hear, I mean, for, even in World War One, we don't think about it. We see it on propaganda posters. They're using bugles in combat, right? They're, they, the British Army, the French Army, the Americans are using bugles. They're using whistles not only for that go over the top guys, um, but, you know, for stop, for lie down, for cease fire, for open fire. There's different whistle calls for all of these operations um, and, and all of these maneuvers, which I think is fascinating. And I'm actually going to give a shout out to my really good friend, uh, Rowan who uh, is over in Scotland and has a great channel where he listed out all of the sig the whistle signals that the British officer was expected to know going into World War I, as well as the hand signals, which turns us a little bit to visual, uh, to visual by the years leading up to the First World War, where you have uh, more extended order, the troops are spread out farther, they might not be able to physically hear their officer's voice on the battlefield, you're going to see the institution of hand signals. And that could be anything from HALT, which I think is still the, the and Andy, correct me for today, this is still HALT, correct. you know, to Freeze, enemy sighted, yes. open fire, you know, all of the above. This is developed during those years after the Civil War, leading up to the First World War, and standardized to the point that this is entering the manuals for the British Army. And again, check out uh, Rowan's video, Subaltern 1914, to see just how they were developed. And I think really comically how there were issues with men um, following the same manual of hand signals, but while they still were holding swords and causing some unnecessary casualties. So um, there's and even, you know, in other visual signals as well, you should see a picture up on your screen of a signal corp uh, station uh, during the Battle of Antietam. They're still bringing, although much smaller, signal corps flags of the same design into combat with them in World War One. The U.S. Army Signal Corps are having guys in the front line with those flags, as well as with telephones, uh, as well as with a semaphore uh, or semaphore flags. Um, we were debating this. Uh, remember it now, the heliograph. So communicating through reflection off a mirror as well. And I think Andy could correct me, but we're still using signal flags like that to help, uh, or at least in World War II. That's the latest I know about the Navy uh, to help so, aircraft uh, land. Let me just break in, in the, here real quick before we go on there. Jim uh, Huck Green asked if you would post a link uh, to that page. So if it doesn't get done during this to your to your buddy Rowan's page, if you would come back and make sure that gets posted, absolutely. please. I will. I will respond to your comment when uh, when this is all done. All right. And. Uh, yeah, Jim, to your point, in World War II, we're using semaphore flags, uh, which we don't really use today, but we still are expected to have guys know how to use it, which is a flag system. Different flags on the Signal Corps flags. Um, the flags that you're talking about for landing uh, guys on aircraft are different, but they are using 
paddle what we call paddles in order to land aircraft. Now we use radios in order to do that. Great. Well, uh, you're landing aircraft on a carrier. Let's move on. Let's talk about technology. Let's talk about balloons and aircraft, Andy. Yeah, so the hot air balloon is something that's around going back to uh, the 1790s. There had been a famous joke that Napoleon was going to try to invade England by balloon because he couldn't get control of the sea in order to do that. Um, But they start to really have practical battlefield uh, utilization during the Civil War. And it's really thanks to a guy named Thaddeus Lowe. What's really cool is he develops this portable hydrogen generator. And uh, hydrogen obviously is a very volatile gas. You should see a picture up on the screen. But these hydrogen generators are very portable, and with his trained core of guys, they could use them for battlefield observation. Famously, during the Peninsula Campaign, the seven days they're going to use, during the battles of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and then during uh, large siege operations. So, um, you know, it's just really cool that you have these balloons. They're relatively small-scale balloons. If you look at the photos on them, you can see the guys next to them, they're, they're fairly large, but... Hydrogen is a much lighter gas than helium that we're used to with modern hot air balloons. Okay. Jim, as we look forward, what do we do in the skies? Yeah, as we're going forward, I mean, there's aircraft are going to take somewhat of a uh, big leap uh, into airplanes. I mean, 1903 is the Wright Brothers. Um, and so we're only talking about an 11-year difference here before uh, between the invention of what we the modern airplane by the Wright Brothers and the start of the First World War. So it's what's interesting to me, and I, and I won't, because we've talked a little bit about aircraft in the First World War in previous episodes. What I think is interesting is how every country looked at this new invention, what they thought uh, it would bring to the battlefield. So, for example, in the United States, the air, airplanes were immediately to be part of the Signal Corps. The American Air Service was considered a subset of the U.S. Army Signal Corps when we enter the First World War. And so you could see it's immediately thought that these guys are just going to be helping us relay messages. These guys are going to be helping us sight the enemy, find the enemy, and it's not necessarily considered as an offensive weapon just yet. Compare that to, say, France, where France actually creates three separate aviation services before World War I because existing branches of the French military have all adopted airplanes, and they've all thought about them in a different way. The French Army engineers see them and they see balloons as well as an extension of defensive fortifications to be able to help sight the big guns in these forts France has constructed after their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. The cavalry are going to see them and create their own arm. In fact, of all the French cavalry divisions who uh, start off in 1914, each one is assigned airplanes. There are airplanes as part of an order of battle of a French cavalry division of every French cavalry division in 1914. And they're going to be used for reconnaissance, what cavalry is expecting to be used for uh, when the war starts. And then finally, you're going to have a smaller group that's assigned to the artillery. And these guys are, as expected, going to be used as forward observers for the artillery. In the end, they end up combining all three and forming the service aeronautique, which becomes the modern French Air Force, and saying, you guys can do all of the above and more. Then compare this, of course, with Britain. Britain has a very strong army, but it's known, as Andy will tell you, for the Royal Navy. And so they actually start two separate air services as well before World War I. The Royal Flying Corps, which is based out of the army, and the Royal Naval Air Service, which is for scouting and helping battleships target in with the Navy. And they end up combining those during World War I to form the Royal Air Force, which we still have to this day. Uh, And you'll have seen photos as we've gone through of American, French, and and British aircraft. Andy, sorry, I I think you wanted to... Yeah, no, I was just going to say one interesting thing is that the British, after World War I, do split the fleet air arm back off into its own separate part of the Royal Navy again. Um, Which is just interesting to me that they did see the value of having a separate fleet air arm for the Navy uh, much as we in the U.S. have, you know, the Navy, uh, I'm a pilot in the Navy. I'm not a pilot in the Air Force that flies with the Navy, you know. Yeah, it, it, I think it's, it's, and not to go too far forward, it's, it's fascinating even to this day to look at how nations view air power. And this is all being born in these years leading up to the First World War and in the first few months of the war, really. In the end, the major use that aircraft are going to have as we look at comparisons between their use in the Civil War and the First World War is going to be scouting. 
You're not going to see major air battles. The first major air battle in history is the Battle of Verdun in 1916, where the French finally group all their aircraft together and tell them to shoot down German aircraft because the Germans are doing a much better job of reporting into their artillery. And so you could see how in the years leading up to World War One, it's considered primarily a defensive weapon. It's for reconnaissance to help the troops on the ground. It's for helping the artillery spot their targets when they're out of visual sight from the ground. But as the war progresses, there's going to be great minds like in the U.S. We have Billy Mitchell who says, listen, we can destroy the enemy's logistics here. We can destroy enemy formations on the ground if we use the aircraft as an offensive weapon. Cool. Cool. Well, Jim, let me, there was just a great photo that we looked at and I put it up once. Uh, let me quick bring it back here. Pardon me there, gang. Uh, Jim, I'm going to put up the prop photo right now. If you would talk about what this is, please. This is just really cool. Yeah. Is this the double, the double edged one or the yeah. double tailed one? Yeah. This yeah. is the studio one. Yeah. So that is a French voisin, V-O-I-S-I-N aircraft. Uh, oh, oh no! Sorry, this is the this is the one of the guys sitting in the studio. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, excuse me. This is yeah. So these are French soldiers in a studio, much like for those of you who've ever got your tin type done. Um, same same sort of setup. It's a pose studio, and one of the settings they could have was sitting in an aircraft. And these things were, you know, the cool new inventions of the day. It's like going to the Air and Space Museum and getting your photo sitting inside of the of the space shuttle, right? It's a really <laughs> cool opportunity to be like, well, check out all this cool technology I'm working with at my job in the military. So, um, of course, it's if you can look now, you can tell it's some cardboard that's really interestingly painted. But you see a <laughs> lot of interest in it. There were there was since it was such a new technology, nobody at the time had any idea where it could go. You, there were people who thought by 2020, we'd all have our own personal aircraft and be flying everywhere. We're not quite there yet, but people just didn't know. So it's a really cool uh, cultural history as well. As you look at how people were thinking of air power and, and the technology of aviation at the time as well. And I think this picture really highlights it. Great. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about the best way to communicate between the continents. How are we gonna? How do we get messages back and forth? Obviously, we've got block raid runners that are faster than ships of the line during the um, during the American Revolution when it takes months to get communication. What's a? How are we moving forward in our intercontinental communication? Well, there, in the eight, late eighteen fifties, there's this really cool drive between the UK and the US in order to lay what's called the transatlantic cable which is essentially a large telegraph wire. It's actually several wires. They're insulated in India rubber, and it's laid on the bottom of the ocean. The technical difficulties of doing this are incredible. It actually required them building the largest ship then ever built, the Great Eastern, um, which is this 700-foot-long ship. It's incredibly large. It's and, up you know, right it's, now, I've Andy. been talking – okay, Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, and you saw originally a map of it. It goes from Ireland to Newfoundland. And then now, you know, you see the ship. It took them two tries to do this because that ship had to be able to carry all 2,000 miles of cable all wheeled up inside of it. It's really, it took a whole Navy to get this done. But it allows for almost its contact between the U.S. and U.K., which has some really interesting implications diplomatically during the Civil War when the U.S. Navy is seizing British ships that have Confederate diplomats on it and causes the British to begin a troop buildup in Canada, Lincoln is able to defuse that, but largely because he has almost real-time uh, communication with his ambassador in London, in order to uh, Charles Francis Adams, in order to defuse that situation. Cool. Well, let me give a quick pitch and make a, one quick correction to you, Andy, and it's something we normally make a mistake on. Uh, that transatlantic cable, if you guys want to see more about that, join us a week from tonight uh, for uh, next uh, the next episode of Civil War Digital Digest. We'll be with historian Mike Washner. And that's actually not surrounded by a hard by India rubber. That's actually surrounded by gutta percha, and we're going to learn what the difference between those two are, and we'll get to see a little bit of that particular cable coming up uh, next week. So join us for the episode next week. It's in editing right now. Well, I look forward to seeing how I'm wrong and learning more on that one. Oh, trust <laughs> me, I've, it's been explained to me, so I know what it is, and I'm happy to share it with you guys. Uh, for now. Jim, I think you and I can pour ourselves another drink. Uh, I was going to say, question. I'm going to sit back and watch it happen. Right, but there's a quick oh. question here first, and that's Mickey Holding, who's asking, how long was the transatlantic cable used for? 
Uh, Mickey, I don't, I mean, I know it's somewhere between two and 3,000 miles. I don't have the exact length offhand. They obviously no, tried uh, to pick the... I, I miss asked, oh, Andy. How, how, long long was was it how long was it in service for? Uh, I'm not sure how long for the original cable. I want to say only about 10 or 15 years. I mean, obviously, today, though, you know, there's thousands of fiber optic lines that cross the bottoms of oceans. Yeah. Uh, that original one, though, I want to say uh, gave out in the 1870s. Is uh, early 1870s is what I'm remembering. So that technology, you know, continues to be the the primary communique, especially between governments, for years after. Famously, the British are tapping the underwater cables during the First World War and are able to relay the German uh, foreign minister's uh, question if Mexico would like to attack the U.S. for getting Texas, New Mexico, and Nevada back. Um, which is known as the Zimmerman telegram. So still a very important part to play, even if it's not the original cable um, for years on. All right. Great. Well, let's move on as our time goes a little long here. Um, I'm going to put one of my favorite photos of tonight up. We're going to wind the screw in the middle of Andy's back. Jim and I are going to sit back. <laughs> Andy, Navy things. Navy things. So first of all, you're seeing a picture up here of a recreation of a French frigate Hermione and the USS Mitcher. I love this photo because you see, you know, a fast ship of the late 18th, early 19th century, and you see a modern warship side by side, and you realize how much 200 years has changed naval technology. Just going from sail power to, you know, steam power, and now, you know, in the Navy, we're using, uh, even you know, gas propulsion systems. You know, you're talking about going from you know, 18 pounders, 32 pounders to a five inch gun. You're talking about missiles, great advances. Uh, you know, one of the big things though, is this idea of changing ships from being rated by how many guns they have to how heavy of the guns they're carrying. You know, if you hear about Napoleonic Wars, this is a hundred gun ship in the line. You know, if you watch Master and Commander, it's a 28 gun frigate. You know, here you're seeing a picture of HMS Victory's gun deck. These are its 32 pounders on its lowest gun deck. These are the heart of the ship. And uh, you should also be seeing a picture of a 68 pound carronade. This is a, this is its uh, uh, forecastle gun. It's a short range gun, but it's very, very heavy. The heaviest gun that gets put to sea during the Napoleonic Wars. I can say when we were planning, we call it, we called it when we were planning the episode, we called it the nasty surprise to borrow a quote from our friend John Weaver, who we did third system forts with in two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, just incredibly devastating. You literally put a 68-pound ball in it and then a cask of musket balls. And when victory burst through the French line at Trafalgar, these just decimated the French artillery crews. Um, but now, like you start, as you start going to the Civil War, you have these hands. You have uh, John Dahlgren, who's a Union admiral, spends years developing these soda bottle-shaped guns. And you should be seeing a picture of the 11-inch gun from USS Kearsarge, which is close to my heart, having served on the current Kearsarge. Uh, you also should see pictures of 7-inch Brook rifles off the CSS Atlanta. Um, and you can see these guns are much larger, and they fire much heavier shells, several hundred-pound shells. Um, so ships are carrying much fewer. I think Kearsarge had seven or nine guns. I, can't, I think seven guns. But two of them were these 11-pound Dahlgrens. They're extremely long-range, powerful guns, and they fire exploding shells. Um and then going forward, you start seeing by pre-World War One, you're talking about 12-inch guns. Like, you should be seeing a picture of a, the USS Delaware getting a 12-inch gun loaded into it. And then that's going to go into, um, you know, we have a picture of the uh, USS Pennsylvania with uh, its turrets post-World War One. These guns are huge. They can go out to, you know, by World War Two, these guns are able to go out to almost 30 miles away. But they're incredibly powerful. I mean, they're several thousand pound shells that if one of these hits you it's going to do i mean you know at jutland several british ships explode because of one shell hitting them in a particularly dangerous area and to be fair it wasn't their fault there was just something wrong with their bloody ships that day true yeah in the words so that was a very <laughs> bad jutland joke for those yes. who uh <laughs> if you can't appreciate a dry sense of humor when people are dying all around you you're not british uh <laughs> But, you know, I mean, these, these guns are literally firing something the size of a Volkswagen Beetle in weight 30 miles, you know. But the Civil War shows this change. 
and you're seeing that you know the wooden ships are extremely vulnerable to, to fire they're extremely vulnerable to damage you know the famous fight of the uh css virginia against the uss cumberland cumberland is a uh sailing sloop of the navy it fires gun after gun at the ironclad does nothing the virginia fires its dahlgrens and brook rifles at point blank range sinks you know sets the cumberland on fire that rams it sinks it it's just a slaughter you know very very interesting the changes that are happening in a very short amount of time which is a common theme with all of these technologies um you know part of it too now you know we're talking about uh, ironclads um you know ironclads at the beginning of war they're coming in all different shapes and sizes i think all of us kind of go right to monitors but you know there's the uss new iron sides which is a casement looking ship you have the, like the monitor itself you have the galena which is essentially a wooden sloop plated in iron uh and then you have the famous city class gunboats on the rivers which a lot of people forget about but these are the first u.s ironclads to go into action at fort henry and fort donelson um you know, they, they quickly are proving their worth, especially in the littoral and riverine environment. You know, these ships, you know, we talked about the rivers being highways. When you have something that can withstand almost any fire on this highway and suppress any fire, they become kind of juggernauts. There's a reason that the, you know, the reason that Admiral Porter could make the run past Vicksburg to allow Grant to capture is he had city-class ironclads, you know, um... That being said, they're not as invincible as people think. Uh, famously, at the Battle of Mobile Bay, the USS Tecumseh hits a torpedo or naval mine, which it then capsized and sunk in about a minute with most of its crew. And this is where Farragut offers his famous, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And, you know, because he knew that, hey, that they had to push past this, this threat, but it was a threat for ironclads as well as wooden ships. Uh, also, one of my favorite stories of the Civil War is the CSS Atlanta, which you should be seeing pictures of. It's a Confederate ironclad built on the hull of a Clyde River-built uh, blockade runner, for your shout-out, Jim. Represent. Uh, which is con Yeah, which is converted into probably the best Confederate ironclad. It's defeated in a 15-minute battle with uh, USS Weehawken, uh, where the USS Weehawken with 15-inch guns pierces the Atlanta's armor. And then the Atlanta then gets captured and turned into a U.S. vessel. Andy, so let me just some really yeah. yeah, let me break in a second. Barry Davis is asking a question here. Uh, first, Mickey Holding is mentioning as we talk about the um, as we talk about uh, forget the uh, the river class, the Cairo definitely gets gets a shout out there. The USS Cairo, yes. And you can see yes. the, you USS can see Cairo. Cairo. You can see that in uh, some level of preservation at the Vicksburg National Battlefield when we're all able to travel again. Then Barry Davis asked the question, did the advancement in naval guns facilitate a change in tactics from capturing the enemy's ship to simply trying to destroy their fleet? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've actually been interested in reading in the Civil War is I've actually come across more captures of warships than I thought had happened, including the CSS Atlanta. Uh, but there's other ironclads that the U.S. captures. There's other warships that gets captured. Um, but there's very few compared to, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, again, going back to Master and Commander, you think about the, at the end of it, the surprise captures the French ship. They don't sink it, they capture it. It's very rare for a wooden warship to actually sink. The problem is you basically have to blow it up in order to make that happen, which is very hard with cannonballs to do. Now, when you have exploding shells, that becomes a lot easier. Great. Well, thanks. Um, uh as before yeah. we go on, Blaine, uh, Karen does say, Andy, there's a marker near Fort Gaines where a shell from the Tecumseh hit the fort. So another another history tourism thing to check up on, everybody. Uh, thanks, Mickey and Blaine, for both of those recommendations there. So, well, let's do this. Uh, what does this do, Andy, to uh, wooden battleships? This is the end. And the end of the wooden battleship has already happened by the Civil War. You know, the, the famous slug it out in the line of battle with wooden ships is gone. There are ships in the line in the U.S. Navy in the Civil War. They are essentially not used as anything other than uh, receiving and supply ships. But you have with the ironclads the beginning of what will be the next line of battle. You know, we talked about Jutland already and, you know, the unreliable ships. Well, the age, of, the next age of the battleship is coming. And you can see, if you look at these early ironclads, you see where they're coming from. Uh, an interesting thing coming out too is submarines. 
you know, the, the CSS Hunley famously is the first submarine we know of to sink an enemy ship. And then by World War One, they have a hell of an impact. And Jim, I think this is, you know, your time to talk a little bit here about yeah. Navy things. <laughs> so obviously you guys have seen a picture up on your screen of the CSS Hunley, and now you should be seeing uh, a picture of several U-boats. Interestingly, the U-boat on the far left of that image is U-20. The Germans assigned uh, numbers after U for Untersee boat or undersea boat, which makes sense. Um, and that's famously the submarine that sunk the Lusitania in 1915. Um, but the, these are them. Uh, these are several German subs, including U-20 pictured at Kiel, which is one of the main German sub bases. And with that, you get a, a new theme of, of sort of naval warfare. And we've seen blockade runners. We've seen the overall Anaconda plan with this idea of the Navy imposing economic warfare on the enemy. They're able to extend that miles beyond the, the idea of just blockading the enemy's coast with submarines. You're able to hit a freighter going from North America to Europe in the middle of the North Atlantic and sink it. And it's not only going to create new fears of protecting shipping, it's also going to create a whole new propaganda machine, right? One of the major, probably for the average American, the major reason the United States enters the First World War is freedom of the seas being threatened by submarines. So and I think an interesting point with that is that is almost the exact same reason that we go to war in 1812, freedom of the seas. I think the political reason with a new technology is an interesting shift for me. Yeah, I think, you know, it's absolutely fascinating for obviously we, we hear more about submarines in terms of the Second World War and the Battle of the Atlantic. But this real fear and understanding of the destruction that they can bring is coming out of the First World War experience. Some of the worst examples of loss of American life in the First World War are not going to come from the battlefields, but going to come from uh, submarines. Famously for all of us as Midwesterners in the chat, in the video here, one of the worst losses of life for the state of Wisconsin is the sinking of the Tuscania off the coast of Scotland in April of 1918, where members of the 32nd Division, Wisconsin and Michigan National Guard, are basically drowned in rough seas with no protection, no warning. Um, and so that fear of this new type of warfare really spreads. Cool. Well, talking about warfare that we can be afraid of, let's talk about something that's coming in during the Civil War and moves on. Let's stay in the sea, but let's talk about mines. So mines, we already kind of referenced this, that the USS Tecumseh is sunk by them. The Confederates were really big innovators in these, and it's really interesting. Um, obviously, they're, they're an area denial weapon, to use the modern terminology. They keep people out, and they're bloody cheap. Even today, mines, there's a reason that, you know, third world nations or second world nations can afford to use mines, and to great effect. You know, the Confederates, you should be seeing a picture here of Confederate mines. They literally are barrels with fusing devices on the ends. Um, but the Confederates used them in Charleston, in Mobile, in the James River, they're extremely effective defenses. They're extremely, one mine can sink a ship. It's a very small investment in something that can have devastating results. And, you know, then, you know, the European nations see what the Confederates are doing. And by World War I, mines are everywhere by everyone. Great. By um, World War One, you have ships that are designed specifically to lay and clear mines. So, yeah, it's, yeah. And, and one of the big things people forget about when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was assistant secretary of the Navy, the U.S. and U.K., it was his big brainchild. They had a minefield that spread from Scotland to Norway to prevent U-boats from using that as a route out into the Atlantic. Cool. Um, yeah. Good. Well, gents, I'm sorry. Let's hang here for a little bit. Uh, Rick Lyon says as a Civil War reenactor and a Navy veteran, he's enjoying the program. Uh, Grant has said that the Navy always seems like it's not talked about as much when talking about the Civil War. We're doing a little bit tonight to counter that, Grant. So, as we come to the end here, we'll answer any questions if anybody chirps in with anything out of the co questions or comments. But let me do this. Uh, one thing we're doing with all of these live streams is we're talking at the end about one cool thing. It doesn't have to be anything all of us are on the spot for something. Uh, Andy, what's up for you this week? What's your cool thing? So I recently just finished a uh, reading the letters of Thomas Osborne, who's a officer in the 1st New York Light Artillery. 
And, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the book is. Uh, no Middle Ground. Sorry, I had to look at it across the room. It's just interesting uh, letters from a guy you don't really hear about a lot, but a really effective artillerist. And interesting how a lot of the things he talked about kind of came up for this week, including landmines uh, at the Battle of Yorktown and just, uh, you know, some of the other logistics and stuff and how interesting and how letters and uh, memoir I'm reading talks about some of these technological advances and really uh, talks about how they changed his experience in the war. Cool. Jim, what's up in your world these days? Well, I'm taking uh, advantage of uh, clear skies and I'm exploring new battlefields. So I made it out uh, to the first time to the Winchester battlefield uh, in Winchester, Virginia this weekend. Um, and it was a really interesting uh, sort of place to see, beautifully preserved by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Trust. And uh, gorgeous and um, plenty of people all keeping socially distanced. Um, so it's a good time to kind of stay distant from people, but explore some new sites um, that might not get uh, a ton of visitation and and support some local businesses. Um, also, the other big thing has been helping out uh, promote getting some pandemic photography done by my friend at the Victorian Photography Studio. So got some cool new tin types. So definitely uh, reach out and uh, doing some exploring. Cool. Well, you've been busy there. Um, I've been busy, and I think my one cool thing is getting to pay it forward a little bit. I got called about three weeks ago by the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. Normally, for about a dozen years, I've commanded the Union side of their Civil War remembrance, and of course, with the pandemic we're in right now, we weren't able to do that this year. They did a virtual Civil War remembrance and asked if we at Civil War Digital Digest would help them. Uh, there's a whole playlist up on the YouTube channel. It's nothing as highly produced as our regular episodes, but it was a heck of a lot of fun to dig in and really think about, okay, we talk about connection. How do we connect people and finding a, quite honestly, a Civil War salad dressing, a vinaigrette, and then doing a simple way to make hard tack. We're going to do something better very soon, but it was fun to do those and be able to help the museum and be able to give back a little bit there. So... Gents, I'm going to say thank you to both uh, Andy and Jim for being with us again. Thank you for those of you who've stayed with us throughout the evening. Um, we'll say two weeks from now, Andy and Jim will be drinking their whiskey and their beer, but they'll be watching. I'm excited to announce that uh, Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images Magazine, is going to be with us, and we're going to be doing a live stream talking about uh, photographs in the Civil War era. Ron and I are still balancing between what exactly that's going to be, uh, but that is two weeks from tonight. Uh, going to add into the... Uh, comments here. I'm going to add both uh, Ron's uh, or the Military Images Facebook page and the Military Images uh, website. So hope you guys check him out. We will have more to say in the next couple of days. But for now, Andrew Roscu, James Taub, thank you both for spending an evening and a drink with me. It's a lot of fun, fellas. The rest of you guys, thanks for spending time with us and look forward to seeing you guys in two weeks and to having uh, Ron Coddington with us. For the Civil War Digital Digest, hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us.